G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, the world's premier spearfishing dedicated podcast brought to you fortnightly by myself, Turbo, and my good mate, Shrek. Now, Shrek's not with us this week again, but he is our anchor man for today's episode, which is an absolute corker. Today, we are talking with Travis Hogan from Aim Right Australia, all the way up there in Cairns. Now, this is a great episode uh, for anybody that wants to know more about Aim Right and uh, their approach to making tough, reliable, accurate, uh, and dependable equipment. And we talked to Travis all about how they how they approach their manufacturing and uh, putting together those uh, those guns and bits and pieces that they manufacture. But uh, before we get into that episode, or well, this episode, I should say, I just want to have a few little shout outs. Uh, iTunes reviews from Peter Pete. Now, how's this? This is a great review. This is this is dead set an honest review. Pete, Peter Pete says second best spear fishing resource after Ant Judge. Wow, thanks, Pete. There's nothing like a silver medal, mate. Really, really appreciate you getting behind us. Uh, another one, I think, from Alex Hayes, mate. Thank you for your kind words. Um, and here's a great one from Chris Everett. Loving the shit out of your chat on the podcast and loving the Brits you feature. Well, that's a green light for us speaking more shit and our guests doing less talking. So thanks, Chris. You've uh, ruined it for everybody. All right, and also Kurt Raymond. Um, mate, yeah, you'll see you're shooting a few nice fish up there in North Queensland or Central Queensland, wherever you are, mate. Keep keep that up. And g'day to Brad Smith. He's in Saskatoon in Canada, and he's going to uh, hunt down some Canadian Spiros for us, hopefully. So thanks, Brad. Good to connect with you again after all this time. So let's get into today's episode. Travis Hogan on aim right gear and spearfishing pelagic species in North Queensland. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Get a couple of books that Turbo and I are both like. The Tim Ferriss books, uh, 4 Hour Work Week and The 4 Hour Body are both available. I also like the look of uh, Undisputed Truth by Mike Tyson. Uh, check that out at audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. I just want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Adreno. You can find them at spearfishing.com.au. They are one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores and stock every piece of spearfishing equipment you could ever imagine. They've got three locations, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. So go and check them out in store. But if you are shopping online, save yourself some money. Use the Noob Spiro code at checkout to save $20 on all purchases over $200. So that is at spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro at checkout. G'day Noob Spiro community, today we are chatting with Travis Hogan who runs Aim Right here in Australia. It's, uh, it's, it's been a long time coming this uh, interview and uh, Turbo's been chatting to Travis Hogan in the behind the scenes about a recent experience he had with cigarette poisoning. So yeah, welcome to the show Travis. Yeah, thanks guys. Unreal, alright Travis, uh, we'll get to cigarette a little bit later mate, but uh, you're up in Cairns at the moment, um, you're the owner of Aim Right here in Australia. Why don't you tell us about um, where you got started in spearfishing? Yeah, my uh, my first introduction to spearfishing oh, was probably, I, I grew up on the Gold Coast and I used to fish the creeks a lot and I had one crack at it there, but I um, was obviously, you know, a young kid, probably about 12 years old by myself and absolutely shitting myself. <laughs> so and, and I didn't really know anyone in the spearfishing scene. I did a lot of fishing, but that was probably my first taste until... Uh, I joined the military. I was in the military for six years, and while I was in the military, I met a, a guy from Newcastle, um, Leroy, and he pretty much introduced me to it. Um, we did a few dives at Seal Rocks and that when we had time off from the military, and that was probably, yeah, my first real taste of spearfishing and where where it sort of started for me. Um, what, did, what did you do in the military? I was a combat engineer. Uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. And so, uh, and that was probably about you know ten years ago that that introduction. Um, I dove you know maybe once or twice a year um, until I um, you know went overseas travelling and, and and picked it up a bit more over there. Oh, where did you where did you uh, travel to and what, what were you spearfishing for? 
Uh, well, I met um, my, my now wife and uh, we travelled to Canada, did Canada for a year, but then when we left Canada, I um, ordered a heap of spearfishing gear online um, and we travelled all through Central America. Um, I was yeah. still very raw to obviously spearfishing, not not really uh, at the Cubera stage, just uh, right around then. But, um, you know, I did a lot of shore diving, getting craze and a few of the parrots down there. Uh, and then I met a guy in Belize, um, a guy called Jack Burnett, and he pretty much was the guy that taught me how to hunt, um, okay. hunt fish. And that's, you know, that's I, I definitely learned a lot off him in Belize and then, you know, carried that through down to when we went to Nicaragua. Um, obviously, having the military background, I knew a lot about, you know, camouflage, concealment, stalking and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, applying those same principles to spearfishing, you know, does work. Um, and then, yeah, from there, pretty much headed back to Australia with a stopover in Fiji. Um, and um, while I was in Fiji, I actually uh, met two guys who you probably know very well, which was um, Travis Corkin and Simon Ladder. Yeah, they, they were over there doing the initial startup for Jaeger from Freedive Fiji, and yeah. I, um, managed to jump on board with those guys. And yeah, ah, oh, cool. So you would have been spoiled over there. Uh, both, both, ja oh, we call them Jaeger. Is it Jaeger? Is <laughs> Jaeger and uh, and and Travis Corkin are both top blokes, and they they know a lot about the underwater world. Um, with your early lessons from Jack over there in Belize, uh, what were some of the hunting essentials that he taught you? Or, or what did you? What were your biggest takeaways? Yeah, the biggest the biggest things I learned from him is, um, you know, we only we we were only diving probably up to ten meters over there, um, you know, mostly shallow, and obviously with you know the local population over there, everything's pretty, you know, gets hit pretty hard. So uh, the hunting techniques that he taught me were, um, you know, get to the bottom first. That's your main priority. So don't try and you know swim down at the fish. Try and get to the bottom. And, and once you're on the bottom, just relax and, and look around, you know, and then it was the scratching of coral and stuff like that, um, you know, rubbing coral together, yeah. um, you know, burling and stuff like that. So, yeah, he, he really taught me um, a lot, you know, of the basics of hunting and, and stalking fish, um, you know, looking in holes and, you know, reading currents, like where the currents are hitting the reef and stuff like that. So, yeah, I definitely picked up a lot there. Okay, it sounds like you had some pretty good mentors from the hunting sort of side of things and uh, and your military background came in handy as well. What about the freediving side of things? Did you have any obstacles or issues really like learning how to do that side of spearfishing? I was pretty, I was pretty fit, so um, I didn't really have any issues with spearfishing. I wasn't spearfishing any great depths, but when I got back to Australia, um, uh, eventually, and I, I was diving up here in Cairns, um, I was going out with a guy who worked at a dive shop um, who was a free dive instructor and, you know, we'd go to dive, you know, I was probably only a 10 to 12 metre diver when I first got back, maybe maximum 15 if I, you know, had a really good dive and we were diving spots in 2022. 20, so it was one of those things where, you know, he was sort of taking us to spots that we had to, you know, push ourselves safely to, if we wanted to shoot fish. Um, so I actually progressed probably a, a lot quicker than most people. Um, and having, you know, someone who's a free dive instructor was definitely an advantage uh, diving with. So, yeah, I definitely progressed, you know, a bit quicker than most. I read a, a post on Facebook the other day. This guy said, I'm headed out tomorrow. I need three divers. Uh, must dive 20 metres uh, and be experienced, know your way around a boat, have a boat licence. One side of me said... Oh, yeah, fair enough. You know, like, it's good to know who you're going out with and that they're competent and all the rest of it. But then the other side of me says, oh, well, hang on, what about the guys that are at, at stuck at that 10, 12 metre level and they're not quite ready for it? And I think we all get put in that, that spot where it's, you know, like, you, you go out with these guys and there's no other option. Did you did you have any troubles with it or did you just slowly start, you know, getting down as, the, as, as like, you... Did you warm up at the start of the day and just slowly progress into it? Yeah, we sort of, um, you know, we, we, we never, you know, we didn't dive deep spots all day. Um, you know, we'd do it on, on a few spots where it's like reef drop off. So, you know, the reef might be five metres and it drops away to 20. So you, know, you can definitely hunt the top or the edges of the reef. Um, but, yeah, in, in regards to that guy advertising that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard when, you know, some guys get, you know, time off midweek and they're looking for someone to dive with and, you know, I guess 
you, you don't want to take out all beginners and have to dive five meters all day because <laughs> yeah. if you, if you want to hit one of your best spots, then you know you need someone to watch you and, and you need to know those guys are up to it. So, yeah. yep. Um, yep. you know, I know down your way in Brizzy and Gold Coast area, you know, um, you know the diving is it is deeper than it is up here. Like we can, some of our best spots are in twelve meters. Mm. Um, so you know, it's it's totally different. Um, to down south, so and, and you know, you, you're definitely going to make sure safety is your number one priority. Yeah, no, cool. All right, you've been spearfishing what ten odd years now. Um, what's one of the most memorable fish you've taken, and uh, what happened there? Um, well, probably the well, there's probably two I'd say. The first one was actually when I was on that, so I'd you know pretty much been learning how to spearfish all through Central America and pretty much teaching myself. Um, come to Fiji, diving with you know two guys who I was completely oblivious to who they were because I hadn't been on the Australian spearfishing scene at all. Um, you know I was pretty lucky to be diving with two guys of that caliber, um, and yeah, managed to shoot my first doggy on that trip, oh, uh, nice. about 12 kilo. So you know, very very lucky. And at the time, I had no idea what a dog tooth was. Um, you know. But I was still stoked nonetheless. But it wasn't until I look back now at that at that trip and realise, you know, some guys do several coral sea trips before landing one. So yeah, definitely lucky in that department um, to land my first doggy on my first blue water trip. But the second one was probably um, the marlin that I took up here out of my trailer boat. Um, yeah. yeah, that was pretty memorable. We we'll, we'll, you know, we knew that marlin were running at that time of the year. Um, we headed out in my 17L and um, got out there. And as we got pretty much close to the spot, the transducer broke on the, <laughs> on the back. So we, we set up like a normal drift like we normally would out wide, um, completely missed the spot and didn't even <laughs> see any bait fish. And so I jumped back in the boat. I went boaty for the time. Um, and then I jumped in the water. I you know, somehow managed to tie the transducer into place um, so that we could read the bottom. Um, we jumped back on the boat. I sounded round, found the bait, um, found the edge that was, you know, most likely to get, hold big pelagics. Um, set up another drift, and on that first drift, we shot three dog tooth and landed them. Wow! Oh, wow! Uh, so, uh, yeah, shot three dog tooth, and then we, at the very end of that drift, up on top of the reef, we had a doggy about 45 ki- kilo come into the flasher, and my good good friend John Louis, who was on the big gun. Um, had already taken a shot of one of the other doggies and missed, um, lo- was loading his gun, and all I had was a 105 roller. I dove down right on top of the fish, didn't take the shot, was waiting for John Louis to get his gun loaded. This this doggy was just sitting there, um, swam back up, and he couldn't get his gun loaded in time. Um, so he jumped back on the boat, went up, started another drift, um, yeah, drifting along. I had the big gun this time. One of the other guys had a had a big gun with a rig line as well, and we're about five, oh, probably about fifty meters into the drift. And I'm looking, looking down, looking down, like searching the bottom for like this this doggy to come back in on the flasher. And then I look up, looking on the surface, looking around for Wahoo. And I look behind me, and there's this marlin just literally cruising oh, into wow. this. And I'm like, oh, <clears throat> that's a marlin. <clears throat> Pretty much did a little duck like breathed all my air out did a little duck dive un like the rig line was um around my fins just undid the rig line casually off my fins turned around and the marlin was like literally three meters off the end of my gun just had like one kick and then yeah just shot it right behind the gill plate and really <laughs> stunned it like i just it just literally stopped where it was and i was like oh oh shit i've stoned this and then it was like gingerly just re- like kicking real slow it came up the surface, and it was, and I, I come to the surface, and you know when we're diving out wide that time of year, there's probably at any one given time about you know six to eight bull sharks on the bottom, uh, big ones like three and a half, four meters, and so I pretty much come screaming to the surface, no, knowing that we had to land this fish and get it in the boat as quickly as possible, and I come to the surface, second shot, second shot. And my good mate John Louis swims over. He's got the other rig line all tagged up, ready to go. I'm like, oh, he's gonna he's gonna stone this thing, put it out of its misery, and he shoots it in the back, and this thing takes off at a million miles. <laughs> and I'm, and pretty much, I just held onto my rig line and I was skipping across the surface. Um, the boat came over, picked the boys up, they jumped back on the boat, and as I'm getting towed along, this these six or eight bull sharks are literally 15 meters down, just following me. 
and I'm just thinking far out. They're just going to absolutely towel this marlin up and then I'm going to be next. I'm just like all these thoughts going through my head. Then the reefies come up and they're swimming with the bull sharks and there's like 20 sharks under me and I'm like, oh, man, we're not landing this. We're not landing this. <laughs> and then uh, the boat catches up um, and my good mate Leroy, who was the one who initially got me into spear fishing, um, he jumped in, the, rolled off the side of the boat and this marlin was pretty much done after about you know 10 minutes of swimming out to sea all these bull sharks under us and um yeah he stoned it um we quickly got it on the boat and we're just absolutely ecstatic and uh nearly flooded the boat trying to get this you know 250 pound marlin on the on the back <laughs> wow um so yeah and that was all by about 10 30 in the morning <laughs> nice. and so pretty much i was like boys day's over we're going to get in and process this fish you know make sure we, we don't waste it so yeah we pretty much packed everything up and and headed in and got some photos on the way and it yeah, got in and started filleting which was a massive process so yeah that's probably my most memorable fish for sure yeah cool yeah, good right. story Trev. that's a, that is that is a cracking fish eh? and land it too awesome stuff oh good all right so that's our memorable fish story mate um you got a, an absolute plethora of species up there you've got blue water you've got reef hunting the whole lot mate um why don't you run us through your your favorite hunting technique and what fish and how you apply it up there um on the reefs of um, northern queensland yeah, so pretty much, um, you know, obviously blue water is, is seasonal. Um, you know, August, September through to about January um, is our pelagics, and that's pretty much currents normally run north to south. It's just a matter of finding, you know, getting out wide where there's plenty of current, finding the bait, find the fish, and just keep moving. Like, you know, during the day, some of our drifts out there, you know, they take like five minutes. Don't, if, you, if you're drifting along, you know, the edge of a reef or something, as soon as you're off the back of that reef, get in the boat, get all your shit in the boat and go back up for another drift. Like You might do 10 or 15 drifts during the day, but you'll see a lot more fish at that front edge and up the front than you will drifting off the back of the reef. Um, so that's pretty much – pelagics is just, you know, you got to read what the water's doing. you got to jump in at the reef and find out which way the current's going, find the bait. Um, you know, don't jump into no man's land and, and hope for the best because you're better off being where the fish are. Um, yeah, see- so, so essentially, you you mainly just drift dive up there, follow the contour of the reef. Uh, so it's do you, do you try and where where do the fish congregate in terms of the reef and the uh, current uh, the current? So it's the front edge generally. Is that yeah, what you'd say? Yeah. yeah so you, you you'll find that your bait like as a current hits the edge of the reef, the bait will sit on that front edge, and your pelagics are coming in because there's there's bait fish, there's bigger fish eating them, and then you got you know your, your big pelagics that are coming through eating bait. Yeah. Um, so that sort of stuff we, we sometimes you know also in the boat we'll go out wide of the shelf you know a, a mile or two and look for floating debris and you know during the season you'll find dolphin fish and wahoo sitting around that um, sometimes we go out looking for big tuna schools and you know with the possibility of finding you know yellow fin so um, we've done you know we've done what people don't see we do a lot of you know trips where we're out searching and you know looking for fish and you know, coming up empty-handed, but you know you've got to persist. You can't you, you can't be same as when guys go to the coral sea. They'll go and dive for doggies for one drift, not see anything, and then they'll go up the reef and start shooting trout. Like if if you if you're serious about shooting good blue water fish and big pelagics, you've got to put the time in. And you know you might come up empty-handed. You know, 15 out of 16 drifts, but that one drift when it all comes together. It's well worth it. Yeah, right. When you're, you mentioned there that you're, you're looking for schools of um, yellowfin tuna. So what are you looking for there? Is it just bird activity? Or? Yeah, bird activity, big bust-ups on the surface. So we went out recently, found a huge bust-up, heaps of striped tuna, uh, moving really quickly. Like it's really hard to keep up to them. Um, but, yeah, like you, you sort of want to find like a really good aggregation of bait fish and and those tuna and, and you know you got to try and get in front of it jump in do a dive to like 10 to 15 meters and hope that there's you know a couple of decent yellow fins swimming through it or there might be a you know a blue marlin or something swimming around eating the bait so yeah so, yeah right so you you sort of track them find out where they're moving get in front jump in and let the school uh come to you and sort of yeah, come around yeah, you and yeah. then take your shots yeah like you know you can do it all day and and, and come up with nothing but You'll generally know if there's like you'll see bigger fish on the surface going through these these bait schools. So um, we saw a little jelly bean yellowfin, nothing really worth worth shooting. But yeah, it's 
Um, every year we get the tuna aggregation, which is like literally an aggregation of, you know, big eye and yellow fin. But um, unfortunately, you've got to be ready to go when, when it's on and, and know where it is. So. so when you're hunting blue water, Travis, you run a blue water setup and that's different from your reef setup? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, we're all, when we're chasing these big pelagics, we're always using rig lines and, you know, two or three floats, um, depending on what you're targeting and either your king venom or your double roller. Um, so, you know, you're making sure that you, you've definitely got enough gun for the fish that you're targeting. All right. And what floats are you running at the back typically? What sort of hard line and, and equipment are you using on your blue water gear? Yeah, so I'm, I've got um, a the, the float line I, I've been using for a while is a Rife, um, the braided one. Um, I also got a Neptonics one as well. Um, and then I'll, I pretty much make my own bungees. Um, for a bit of, I guess, confidence in, in my gear not breaking, and then just running the um, aim right um, two atmosphere floats, just two or three of them, depending on the size of the fish that you're targeting. Okay, cool. Yeah, right. Mate, you mm. mentioned um, doggies, uh, and that's another, like, sort of popular species that guys go to North Queensland to target, and you're talking about the front edge of the reef. Is there any sort of – is there anything else? Is there any other little – things that guys should look for when they're targeting um dog tooth tuna when um and this is this is a pretty big thing as well a lot of guys will come up here and and go on coral sea trips um you know in the hope that they'll see big dog tooth but you've got a i guess a, a re it's really beneficial having either a guide or someone on your charter that lives up here dives up here a lot and and can point you in the right direction because you know, some of the charter boats will, you know, depending on the weather, will anchor where where is the safest. Um, and you know, they may have seen dog tooth there when the current was, you know, going in that direction. But if the current's going in the complete other direction on the other side of the reef, and you're at the back of the reef, you're literally not going to see a thing. So, you know, you need you need those guys on your trip, either got like you know, guiding or you know, helping you give you the best chance to find these doggies because. You've got to be where that current is. Doggies love current, um, you know, and obviously, you know, they're feeding. And, and then same thing, like you've got to be, you know, more early morning and late in the arvo is probably your best times as well. That's terrible for Turbo. He hates early starts, Travis. I can love him, mate. Yeah. <laughs> well, arvo is pretty good as well. But also, like, as well, if you're up the ribbons, um, you know, the ribbons really turns on later in the year. And, um, you know, you've got to be diving those incoming pushes of the current and the tide because that's when all the clean blue water comes in and it brings in those big pelagic fish. Um, and then on the outgoing tide, that's the reverse. You've got all your reef species are up and alive. So Awesome. That's a pretty comprehensive hunting technique for your part of the world. So yeah, Excellent. Look, Travis, what's the um, toughest situation you've found yourself in in the ocean and uh, what did you learn from it? Um, I, I sort of... You know, obviously, uh, being military, you know, we get taught the seven Ps, which is prior pe preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance. So the best thing you can do is be as prepared as you possibly can so that, you know, anything that happens becomes minor. Um, but probably the most tough or one of the toughest situations I've been in is one of the first trips I guided up the ribbons, um, we were guiding a trip, and um, there was a young kid on our trip, Quinn, and, um, yeah, we were in the water spearfishing, and we got word that he had been bitten by a shark. Um, we jumped back on the tender, went back to the boat. Um, luckily, he was um, already on the boat. Rick Batur was on that boat uh, okay. as well. Uh, he was diving with the young kid. They uh, heavily, you know, padded his... his and bit him right on the Achilles, opened him up pretty severely. Um, we were at river number three, which is about 60 mile from port. Mm -hmm. um, padded his leg, wrapped it up heavily, bandaged it, elevated it. You know, young kid, pretty distraught. Yeah. But Rick was doing a great job at keeping him calm. Um, so we had to get him choppered out. So we called a chopper, waited for the chopper to come, uh, and then... The hardest thing was getting him from he was inside on the bottom deck up to the top deck and between lift between getting him off the couch and getting him upstairs he, he had a bandage 
pretty much the size of a volleyball on his ankle, so very heavily bandaged. And it was like a shower of just blood coming out when we had to get him up the stairs. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, lost a lot of blood, got him up. You know, he felt very lightheaded, understandably. There was blood everywhere. Um, you know, a lot of people on the trip very upset um, and wondering, you know, what to do. We're only, in, you know, I think it was day four of a seven-day trip. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, one of the guys on the trip, um, Joe Martindale, was actually his, his boss. And um, we had a chat to Joe and, you know, we'll pretty much go on, all right, let's can the trip. Like, that's something that's pretty, you know, heavy that's happened. You know, let's can the trip. And Joe was actually saying to us, if we cancelled the trip and, and went back into port, Quinn would even be, like, you know, being a young kid, 17 years old, he would probably be more upset with the fact that, you know, he ru- or, you know, he would assume that he's ruined our trip. And, and um, you know, that's the last thing Joe said he would want. So, you know, it was a tough decision. We, we continued spearfishing for the guys. Um, and Quinn, you know, we, he got back to Cairns Base Hospital and, you know, he made a full recovery, which was great. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of the worst things I've experienced as far as spearfishing goes. So yeah, right. So just uh, having the fact that you had people on board that knew what to do and um, the right communication tools, sort of like you know, made that sort of situation turn out a lot better than what it could have been. I guess. Yeah, Pete from Bianca Charters was a skipper and very knowledgeable in regards to the Coral Sea and you know operation of a charter boat. So. Um, some very experienced heads there, you know, Rick, ex-military, 32 years and seen, you know, seen everything. So, um, yeah, very, very lucky um, to have those guys on board. We're hoping to get Rick on the show at some stage. I've, I've been in talks with him. Uh, he's ex-Aimrite as well, is that right? Yeah, so Rick Rick was the founder of Aimrite. He started Aimrite back in 1998, building trigger mechanisms and muzzles and bits and pieces for custom spear gun manufacturers and then... Obviously, the Aimride brand developed over a period of years, and back in 2012, I think it was, was when me and my wife purchased the business. So um, Rick still runs Aimride America um, at the moment. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of things happening within the business this year, fingers crossed. Um, you know, we'll have America back and, um, yeah, hopefully look at expanding the business and doing some really good things. Yeah, it's good to see an Australian-based business doing so well, and uh, your guys' gear is is very popular, uh, qu- and you know, qu- quite rightly so throughout the Australian community. By the sounds of it, yeah, um, I think you know, obviously, Rick's a perfectionist. I'm a perfectionist, and you know, you got to make sure that the, the gear's up to the task. And I think the fact that you know we've overbuilt these spear guns for the last you know 15 years, um, and we the reason we over-engineer everything is. For the fact that we just, you know, we know that we're probably never going to see that spear gun again for any type of warranty, um, and and that's why we were the first, and and we're still the only ones to offer a genuine lifetime warranty. Chances are, if you're listening to the Noob Spiro podcast, you love hearing other people's adventures, stories, tips, and techniques and what they have learned from around the world. Now, Spearing Magazine, Noob Spiro's partner, have got the best spearfishing magazine in the world, and it is jam-packed with stories from all over the globe. If you go to spearingmagazine.com, you can buy yourself a subscription to the magazine and get a free hat or long sleeve shirt. That's spearingmag.com. Noobspiro.com is the place to buy your next t-shirt from. You've probably looked in your drawer lately, you've got three or four and they're all tattered and ugly. Get a decent one this time, one you actually like wearing. Now these are comfortable shirts, we went through a couple of different versions before we settled on the, the shirts we like. The material's nice, it's quite nice in the summer when it's, when it's hot, comfy against your skin. They feel good, 35 bucks, free shipping till the end of the year. Get your hands on them at Noobspiro.com. Cool, this will help us transition well into the next section, which is the Veterans Vault. And uh, this is the part of the show where we ask our special guests to take us deep into an area of their expertise. And so we've teed up to chat with you about spear gun modification, maintenance, and probably have a little bit of a discussion about the benefits of some of the different designs as well while we're there. Yeah, no worries. Cool, so, all right, so at the moment, before the show, we were talking about uh, you're seeing a lot of guys that are modifying their own spear guns, and you had some 
some words and some tips and some advice for them to get started. I think I'll just put the ball in your court, Travis, and uh, go, go where you want with it. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, one thing I've seen a lot lately is, you know, and, and obviously guys want to be involved and, and make their own guns and, um, you know, that's fantastic. You know, it has to start somewhere, which is great. Um, but you've got to ensure that, I guess, if you're going to modify a spear gun, first of all, speak to the manufacturer of that spear gun. Um, you know, all spear guns are designed and built differently, and some spear guns will handle certain things better than others. Um, one thing, you know, you've got to ensure you do is you don't want to make a spear gun that's, you know, got all this power, but, you know, the buoyancy isn't there, and all of a sudden it's real nose heavy, and, you know, it's, it becomes an ineffective spear gun. Um, so, yeah, what I would say to people is, you know, speak to the manufacturers who are making these guns and, and tell them your idea. And most of the time, those guys, you know, all the guys that have contacted me telling me what they're going to do, you know, I'm more than happy to chat to them and um, give them advice. But speak to the manufacturer, making sure, make sure you're not doing anything outside of, I guess, the guns uh, or what the gun can actually handle. Um, you know, because the last thing you want to do is be overloading trigger mechanisms and having guns misfire and, you know, or wearing the trigger out quicker and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you've shot your mate. So um, definitely talk to manufacturers before you start modifying spear guns. A, you might void the warranty or B, you know, these guys, you know, have, you know, years and years of experience in their, in their field. You know, I've only been doing it for five and a half years now but the guy that taught me has been doing it for you know 20 years so yeah. everything i've learned was from him um and i still speak to rick almost every day you know in regards to spear gun manufacturing so you know speak to the experts speak to the guys that are building these guns you know seven days a week you know 365 days a year because nine times out of ten they'll be able to point you in the right direction and ensure that the, the gun you're building is going to be one that's going to be real effective and, and you know, obviously get you a lot more fish. Yeah, absolutely. What, uh, what, what are some of the trends you're starting to see with gun modifications um, that are either good or bad? Uh, probably, you know, obviously, you know, there's guys out there such as Emmanuel Bova, you know, who sells like a, a roller head kit, um, comes with rubbers, comes with everything, instructions. That's great because, you know, his roller, his roller muzzle suit just about every single gun and, you know, setting a gun up with as a single roller is fantastic. You know, you're not going to really do any major damage. Most guns are built to handle, you know, twin rubbers. So, you know, one one rubber, you know, roller is not going to really, you know, hurt the balance of the spear gun or, you know, the, the it's not going to overload the trigger mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the guys that are out there and, you know, the, the thing is so most guys, you know, have a bit of, you know, knowledge about what they're doing, but the guys, there's guys out there at the moment who are taking your standard rail gun and they're putting like a double roller muzzle on the end, um, you know, nine mil shaft, all this, setting them up and selling them to their customers and the customers are going out there and because the, we, we, we built a double roller muzzle, you know, to, to build probably, it was the very first double, uh, double roller rail gun. Um, we designed We've actually designed two barrels around that muzzle to make sure that the buoyancy um, isn't compromised. And guys are taking like a standard Rob Allen rail gun and a standard Rabitech rail gun, putting a double roller muzzle on the end. And these things are becoming absolute pigs of guns because they're just super nose heavy. So guys are nearly breaking their wrist trying to shoot them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's just that's probably the worst ones I've seen. Um, but the best ones that I've seen are probably guys who are out there converting their guns to, you know, just a standard rail gun to a, to a really effective single roller and shooting a lot of good fish. Um, yeah, they're probably the best ones. And then obviously, you know, there's guys out there, um, you know, making inverted rollers. Um, inverted rollers are great, but they're a very, very complex spear gun for Australian spear fishing. We don't really have um, super elusive fish. Um, or we're not usually taking a shot that's, you know, seven to eight metres like the Mediterranean uh, where they, you know, they're diving 40 metres, they've got one shot and they've got to, you know, load up several different bands to, to get that really effective shot, whereas in Australia you're shooting like coral trout, tuskies, mackerel and stuff. There's really no need for, you know, this big inverted spear gun that takes like 10 minutes to load. Um, you know, it's, it's just it's overcomplicating things and it just, it's just not suitable for Australian diving, which is pretty much why, 
you know, unless unless you're targeting big blue water fish, uh, big tuna, big marlin, and stuff like that, where you know you've got one shot and you need all that power. Um, for everyday reef diving, it's just yeah, overkill. I've sort of let, let me tell a little bit of a story, and then you can make of it what you will. But one thing I realised when I started spearfishing is to buy any spear gun, you're sort of looking at two hundred bucks starting, and then they go right through to you know a couple of thousand dollars really. But you know, and the, and you you know a lot of these young guys are walking into the retailers and they ask the retail guys their advice, and you you get a a heavily biased point of view, which is quite often really good because the the guys sell gear that they believe in and use themselves. However, they might not have experienced the full range of equipment. And for a new guy that's walking into a shop who knows nothing about spear guns, he's going to get sold a gun that he's probably going to stick with for the rest of his life. There's no real opportunity for guys to get in a pool and use 20 different types of spear gun and work, work out from the start what their real or true preference is. What, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's. I'd say it's really hard, like you said. Like if you, if you can't get in the pool and test the guns and you know have a shoot of a rifle, a Rob Allen, a Rabi Tech, and, and an aim right and go all right. This this is the one I like the best. It's hard. Like your next best option is to borrow your mate's gun, find out someone that's got one, you know, and have a few shots of it. Um, mm. Yeah, that's probably like your only bet. We actually have just started working with or we've started doing pool sessions with um, the dive shop up here, Divers World. Okay. Um, and we've been to the pool, I think, twice or three times and shot some different guns, um, which obviously, you know, it's it's the guys that I, I dive with in that in that dive shop are, are you know, very experienced divers, which is great. Um, we're not shooting anything crazy like no big blue water cannons. We're just shooting like a few little rollers and stuff that we've put together um but yeah it's really hard for you know a guy walking into a dive shop i think the best thing you can do is get on google do your research see what people are buying and and, and speak to the guys that are out there using those guns so if, you, if you're really interested in like a rob allen get in touch with like a brett verka or a, or someone like that obviously you know sponsored guys are going to be biased but you know, look at the guys that are out there using the guns and ask them why they why they love those those guns and why they love that particular brand. So, yeah, I've I've yet to see um, someone develop a like a, a matrix that rates spear guns for all the, all the different ways in which they can perform well. Uh, you know, from cost to accuracy to to um, you know everything like ease of usability, everything. Um, yeah. Do you know of one? No, it's it is you know it, it does come at the end of the day. It comes down to two things. It comes down to personal preference and budget, mm, and some true. and some, sometimes those things don't align. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate perfectly to that. Yeah. That's a very and, honest statement. And aim right, you know, we are on the higher end of of the market. We we are a premium product, um, but like I said, we're Australian made, and we're, we we offer a lifetime warranty, and you know that means. If you buy an aim right and in 10, 15 years time something goes wrong, ring me up and say, Trav, this happened, we just fix the part, we sort it out, no worries, which is something you'll probably struggle to get out of any other manufacturer. Mm. That's right. Mm. Travis, you guys offer um, aluminium and carbon barreled guns. Yeah, um, we do both. Yeah. Mate, what are you what are your thoughts on those? Um, the guys starting out and what are the advantages of both of those um, materials? Um the advantage of oh, aluminium is like a great entry level gun, um, especially for your budget. Um, we use the same handle and trigger mechanism as we do on a, a an entry level aluminium as we do our double roller. So we don't we don't cheapen any of our parts to to make a cheaper gun, and that's that's why our aluminium is definitely on the higher end of the scale because we we don't cheap out on any parts just to just to make, you know, a, a better sale. Um, so, yeah, the aluminium's great. They're durable. They'll last forever. You can bang them around in the boat, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, and they do perform just as well um, as, you know, our higher-end guns. Um, but the advantage of carbon is our carbon barrels, you know, uh, are probably some of the thickest, if not the thickest, on the market with our King Venom and our Rage being... 4.4 mil thick, which is in comparison to a competitor's carbon gun, is about 1.6. Okay. 
But yeah, we over-engineer them. We know that they're never going to break. We can actually sit a land cruiser on top of our barrels. Um, you've, I'm not sure if you've seen that advert. Uh, nah. We have used the King Venom on a tractor and picked up the front of a car. <laughs> so, you know, we everything's over-engineered. You can bang our carbon round in a boat, scratch it, everything like that. It's never going to break. Um, and, you know... At the end of the day, if it starts looking a bit shabby, you just sand it back and re-epoxy it and it looks brand new. Um, so, 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 so carbon's super light and you guys have sort of got around some of the arguments of it being not as strong as um, aluminium by thickening the wall. Yeah. Um, the other benefit I heard the other day was uh, it muffles noise a lot better than aluminium. and uh, So that's a, that's a huge yeah. benefit. Is that something you've noticed? Uh, yeah, it definitely muffles noise, and it also absorbs the recoil a lot better than aluminium. Okay. Ah, right. Uh, yeah, so, but, yeah, that's, that's I, I don't understand why, you know, I know carbon in general is, is designed for building things that are super strong and super light, but obviously the lighter you build a spear gun, the more recoil you're going to get. Mm. Uh, so that's why we overbuild them. That's why we build our barrels. I think our thinnest barrel is 2.8 millimetres thick. Um, you know, we want to have that mass there um, and, and absorb that recoil, but at the same token, you know, we're still um, we're still super strong. Uh, we're, not, we're not, you know, you'll never break an aim right barrel, that's for sure. So the cuttlefish shape is present in a, several of your guns, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yep. I, I haven't actually. I've used an aim right. I've used the King Venom for probably half an hour. That's been my sole. And complete experience with a with an aim right gun and it was actually the first time i ever used an open muzzle gun so it took a little bit of adapting to and that's another thing i was going to talk to you about is before i talked about young guys not being able to trial out all of the um different types of equipment that are available particularly around spear gun technology but even for the guys that have been using an aluminium barrel or or a wood barrel for three or four years and they want to try something else there's a really big adjustment phase, just switching something as minor as a stock or a barrel. Um, how, how do you advise guys around that? It's it's simply just time in the water and time shooting the gun. Um, I know guys that go out and buy, you know, they've been using, there was one guy actually recently up here in Cairns, he's been using a gun that was made by Rob Torelli 12, 13 years ago. He's been using that for years and years. Um, went out, bought an 85 Aimright roller, and went out two days in a row and stoned pretty much every single fish. Um, and then I know guys that have bought the same gun and can't hit the side of a barn door. Um, so, and, and then eventually they'll come around and they'll, they'll figure out what's going on. But a lot of the aim rights will aim from the back of the handle, whereas, you know, your Rob Allen's typically aim from the, the tip of the spear. So, you know, it is a, a slight adjustment period. The more, the more time you spend in the water shooting the gun, the better you'll get. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And and, yeah. and I think it is a little bit of a personal case. Like you've identified just a change between, you know, one brand, one brand and yours. Um, what about guys just going from a closed muzzle to an open muzzle? I mean, you've got kind of two distinct shooting styles there as well. So how how do you get around that? Yeah. Um, same thing. Just time in the water shooting the gun. I found that I went from a um, a closed muzzle to an open muzzle aim right, which was actually a Super Venom X, which has the same muzzle as a King Venom, um, I found that I was a lot more accurate with an open muzzle. Um, okay. When I go back to a closed muzzle, if I'm in the water diving with, you know, one of our team guys, a couple of them have asked me to build them a gun with a closed muzzle on it, which we've done no dramas. Um, and, you know, we're in the water, I'm on the big gun, open muzzle, everything's all good. And then we switch up for the next drift and I'm on their real gun and, I look down the shaft and I'm just like, how do people dive with this big annoying thing right in their way of yeah. you know, seeing? But some people can't shoot an open muzzle. Like they've got to have that closed muzzle. So, you know. There's that. There's two distinct shooting styles, I reckon. I call it orthodox where the guys aim down the line of sight of the barrel. And you've probably been taught that way from the military, which yeah. is, you know, and you align down the barrel. Turbo shoots like that. I look on the fish where I want to shoot and, and I pull the trigger. I never align down the barrel. And when I try and do it, do you, I, so, I, you, I, don't, I, don't aim, I don't hit what I'm aiming at. Because you look, you look at the guts of I the look, fish I look, <laughs> and, and you pretty much hit it every time. 
Uh, I, I do have good and bad days, I will admit, and I've switched guns more than I should have. Um, but um, the guts is better. At least you don't ruin the fillet. Well, yeah, well, and, I, and it saves me time. I don't have to sit there with a knife doing it at the end like poor old Turbo does with all his yeah. wicked headshots yeah. on, the, yeah. on the two fishy shoots each year. Oh, it's all I want, mate. <laughs> uh, but no, no, yeah, I think there's definitely two distinct shooting styles. One guy looks down the barrel, and the other guy. I think looks just uses um, other alignment tricks to to do it. They try we triangulate, I think. But uh, you well, see the same you see the same thing in a few other things like playing pool and um. It's, you're it's not good at that either. You need to yeah, change. I'm really up. good at that. I'm really good at all this looking stuff. down. I don't know what you're just about. line something up and you'll hit it. It's not uh, a. Oh, here we go. Well, there's, there's a very good diver in Australia. Actually, probably one of, if not the best, one of the best bureaus in Australia. Bryson Sheehy, and I know that he aims down the side of the gun. Okay. So there's something for you. See, yeah. down along something. He's not yep. just looking. He's not just well, on the gun if from you, the head. If you look at some of the best Sparrows <laughs> in the world, and particularly our part of the world, Ian Puckridge uses a closed muzzle, and yep. so does so does um, Dwayne uh, over, muzzle. Over, yeah. over, over there in NZ, and they're both champions. And I know the benefits of a closed muzzle are you can reload much faster and they use a single band and all the rest of it. But I, it doesn't seem to affect their shooting, and uh, so it is very much a personal preference thing, I think. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm just correcting Turbo here, Travis. He's looking at me seriously, <laughs> oh, bastard. <laughs> but anyway, all right. What other? So, any other modification sort of things that you're coming across at the moment, apart from the roller sort of transitions? Um, no, that's that's about it. Um, you know. Obviously, there's a few guys that just just check with the manufacturers. Make sure you're not going to void the warranty. Make sure you're not doing anything outside of you know the specifications or you know what the gun can handle, especially the trigger mech. You know the last thing you want to do is be pointing a dangerous spear gun around, not knowing when it's going to go off. So, mm. um, you know we we test all our trigger mechanisms in house three times before we actually build the spear gun. So that w- once the customer gets out there and They've got the gun in their hand that we we know that nothing's ever going to go wrong. So, okay. So, uh, just another quick question: with with the spear guns you're selling at the moment, um, have you got the same gun that comes with a conventional open muzzle and then a roller muzzle? Have you got the same gun just in those two different types of muzzle? Yeah. So, in our basic entry level carbon range, um, we do a Fury carbon and we do a Fury roller. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we do those two, and then obviously, you know. You get up into the sort of higher end stuff like the Vengeance and the Fury. Oh, sorry, the Vengeance and the Rage. And, you know, both of those guns are pretty much purpose-built real guns. Um, you know, Ah, right, yep. Yeah, once you shoot a fish with, like, we can run an 80-meter 80, 80 reel um, full wow. of Dyneema on the, on, the, um, on the Rage, and it'll float horizontal on the surface with a shaft out. Wow. So, very nice. Yeah. So, so I, I was going to ask you how sales are trending. Um, are more? Are you are you selling more roller guns now than you are the conventional bandit guns? When we first started doing rollers, which was probably about two and a half, three years ago, I think it was about three years ago now. Literally, I was doing. I swear to God, I, about ninety percent of our sales was rollers. It was just, it was insane. It's definitely tapered off a bit now, and it's it's back to probably you know fifty fifty. Um, okay. but, um, yeah, it was, it was insane that period. It was literally like, you know, there was like 20, 30 spear guns there and, you know, 90% of them were rollers. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of, I guess, you know, a lot of guys went out there, used rollers and if people like myself, um, you know, and Rick and a few others, you know, I, I will never go back to a conventional spear gun. Um, I went back to one for about eight months um, before I did the Australian titles, just just so that I had a more simplified spear gun, um, and I didn't like it one bit, and went straight back to the roller. So yeah. Uh, yeah, the, re- the recoil is offensive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> After yeah. you've switched, uh, yeah. So for guys that are um, looking to switch technology, it was time in the water, and just um, giving it a good crack before you give up on it, I guess. And uh, there's some other good 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 stuff in there as well. Yeah, definitely, you know, and make sure you're using the right gun for the, you know, for what you're, the area that you're spearing. So don't don't be hunting the coast in two metres vis or three metres vis with a 1.3, you know. Actually. Stuff like that, so. 
If I was to ask you a question, if you were to say you're going to get one gun for the rest of your life, you've got to make the most versatile gun um, that you could ever have, what would be the... Um... He's an engineer. There's no way he's using one gun. Yeah. And a bit, no, if I had to choose one gun to hunt with for the rest of my life, couldn't use any other gun, it would be a 105 roller for sure. Okay. There you go. 105, 105 roller. same as mine. How come you like 105 and not 1 metre or 1-1? One, one? Oh, I think what we did just to, for something different, it was, you know, we, we made the rollers in half sizes. That way we could run, you know, you can choose to run a shorter overhang or a longer overhang. Um, I found that in the shorter guns, like, your, you know, your 85, 95 rollers, where you're hunting the coast in like three to five metres veers, shooting big dew and barra, you know, you want that shorter spear, um, you know, thick spear, um, you know, because you want to be able to swing that gun around and, all that sort of stuff. And then I was running a shorter spear on the 105 um, for a while and, you know, I was I was pretty accurate. I thought I was, you know, shooting a lot of good fish and, and hitting them where I wanted. And as soon as I ran that bit of extra overhang, so our, our guns are all standard 30 centimetres overhang, as soon as I went to that 35 centimetre overhang on my 105 roller, I literally stone everything. Like I, I point that shaft no matter – what fish it is, and, you know, like eight, eight times out of ten, I'm stoning fish. Wow. Um, and I just find that with that little bit extra overhang, I became a lot more accurate. Um, so for anyone out there that's having trouble, you know, with, with the shorter spear, try the long, try something slightly longer. Okay. Yeah, right. So what overhang do you, do you recommend? Is it 34? 350. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 35 on the, um, on the bigger rollers for sure. Okay, cool. Hmm. All right, I've heard some similar some similar numbers elsewhere, so that's cool. Shrek, my diving of late has improved out of sight, and do you know why? No. Because I, pick, I picked myself up a copy of 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing. Wow, is that why your hunting techniques have improved as well? Not just my hunting techniques, my free diving, my breath hold, and my awareness. Wow, you really are a Spiro 2.0. Yes, that's right. I really am a Spiro 2.0, as per Chapter 7, I believe, Spiro 2.0. <laughs> and it's all thanks to? 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Now, what? where did I find it, you ask? On Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So get on Amazon.com and check it out. But in all seriousness, it's a great book compiled from over 40 contributors. It's absolutely fantastic, and you will improve your diving, guaranteed, if you read that book. There's tips there from legends like Rob Allen and Chris Coates out of South Africa to Simon Tripp. And uh, some other Aussie guys. Lots of Aussie guys. Lots I think, of Aussie I think guys. There might even be some New Zealanders in there. There's Dwayne Herbert. Dwayne Herbert. Darren Shields. We've got Cameron Kirk Connell. A couple from myself there. I put myself in that same league. Yeah, so look, a Turbo's ones, we, we glazed over them. <laughs> and uh, look, I, took, I often took 10 of Turbo's tips and punched them into one so you get good value for money. Find it cheap on Amazon.com. 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Guys, finally a magazine Turbo won't get in trouble with his girlfriend for reading. <laughs> Sparing Magazine, it's the world's best spearfishing magazine and they kindly sponsor the new Sparrow podcast, which funnily enough is the world's best podcast. Oh, it's so, a match made in heaven. <laughs> Together at last. Join Sparing Magazine on Facebook, Instagram or YouTube and connect with sparingmagazine.com. All right, well, funniest story. What's the funniest thing that's happened to you at spearfishing or, or one of your buddies? Yeah, I'm a pretty serious diver <laughs> when I go out. Um, yeah. you know, it's all about getting good fish and, you know, working hard. And, and until, you know, that last dive's done, you know, then we'll crack a beer and, and have, a, have a laugh. But I'm generally a pretty serious hero. But the funniest thing that has probably happened on one of our trips is we did, it was actually three years ago to the day, if you can believe it, um, we did a 10-day coral sea trip. We went out and were the first ones, or one of the first ones, to explore um, Willis Island, which is about 260 nautical miles offshore. Wow. Uh, and we went out there chasing doggies. Uh, we did. We saw a lot of good dog too. Shot some really nice ones, but the sharks were just absolutely insane. Um, we landed some nice fish. I got one 37 and a couple of other 30s, and then a few of the other guys got some nice ones, but. We pretty much dove hard for 10 days, and then on the way back in, we started getting on the beers, and it was probably, oh, it's, it's a long way in, and pretty much got late in the evening, and we decided to do a Harlem shake at it. 
<laughs> and yeah, it's pretty insane. If you go on to um, YouTube under C Ash, okay, um, and Google Harlem Shake at it, holy crap! Yeah, we we got pretty loose that trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I think we finished up about one in the morning after starting at about I don't know twelve. <laughs> that's a good session. Uh, so yeah, it was a good session and yeah, good times. But that's probably one of the funniest things we've been a part of. All right, so dive bag. What's in your dive bag, head to toe, in your everyday sort of is dive kit? Any, any aim right stuff in there? Yeah, is there a bit of aim right gear? Yeah. Um, so um, I'll start from the bottom. <laughs> the first the first thing I've got is I've got um, a set of aim right carbons made by um, Larry from Penetrator. Okay, good. Um, Larry's made us made um, made aim right or fins for about the last six months, and a few of our guys have been repping them and. You know, before that, I was using um, one of our um, one of our carbon fins made by our carbon factory, and the the difference that I've noticed going from those fins to these carbons is astronomical. Yeah. Um, I found that I could dive the whole day, no leg fatigue. You know, kick as hard as I want. Yeah, much better fin. So yeah, really happy with the the um, aim right carbons we're producing at the moment. What what pockets um, are you guys running? Um, I run the Mares. Okay. okay. I found that they're probably the most flexible and, and softest pocket that's available. Mm, we'll probably in, in in the coming months, I think we might develop our own. Um, but yeah, we'll see how we go. But just running the Mares at the moment, I find that they're yeah really comfortable. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, then I've got a pair of Aimrite dive socks, which are um, the one the camo ones that we're making at the moment. Um, are they a two mil sock or? Uh, we do a 1.5 and a 3, Okay. So depending on summer or, or winter. Yep. Yeah, once it gets down to about 26, yeah, we have to get the winter <laughs> gear. <laughs> oh, poor bugger. Yeah. And a 7 mil suit too, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then, you know, obviously our aim right suits, which um, we've been making for the last three and a half years now. Um, super comfy suit um, made by Roger Yazbek, who makes almost every other suit in the world. Okay. Yep. Um, so yeah, aim right suit, um, and then I've got just a um, old rubber weight belt. Definitely rubber's better than any other material. Um, it lasts long, um, and it doesn't cost you that much. That you can usually pick them up for about thirty-five to fifty bucks. Yeah. A um, couple of weights. I've got um, what knife am I running? I think I'm running a, a Mac. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, fine, that's a really good, got a really good serrated edge and um, pretty sharp knife. Turbo's coffin, I, I missed what sorry, brand that no. was. What, sorry, what brand was it? Uh, I think it's the Mac Collarette. I think oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we'll probably produce our own knife towards the end of the year, um, but they're a really good knife at the moment. Yep. Um, Aussie, Aussie Reels um, belt reel. Yep. Yep, can't beat them. And then um, up top, I've been running a Bushat Max Lux mask for about oh three years now and i find that i know a lot of guys run the smaller masks and the small volume and this thing has still quite a small volume but the peripheral vision that i get out of this mask i, pr I prefer to be able to see you know a lot more out wide and have a better better view than you know having you know a few extra mils of air i suppose yep um, cool, yeah. And it's just basic J, J snorkel. Don't even know what brand it is. Um, what else? And then, then depending on where I'm hunting, it's it's one of my rollers. So I've got, I think I've got, well, I've got a 70 centimeter cray gun and an 85 roller, 105 roller, 115 roller. I've got a 140 king venom, a double roller, <laughs> and then I've got my custom made blue water gun that's water ballasted that I built myself. Hey, on say. 70, 85, 95, 105, 115. Uh, yeah. so you asked him to go to one gun. He was just like <laughs> snorting. <laughs> yeah. That's, you know, obviously, obviously being a spear gun manufacturer, we're, we're very spoiled and have a, a, a large choice of spear guns. But if I had to, if you, if you, you know, obviously got a budget and you want two spear guns that do everything, you know, a 140 standard rail you got to think about you know okay i want to shoot dog tooth or i want to shoot you know big marlin or big tuna you got to ask yourself how how much of that diving you're actually doing you know if you're going on one coral sea trip a year you don't need a big flash gun like i'm sure there'll be someone on the trip that'll have one or 
you know, if you're going to buy something, I'd run like something like a 130 or a 140 King Venom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can set that gun up with either three bands, eight mil shaft that can take down pretty much anything. The King Venom's currently responsible for the doggy Wahoo world records, as well as the two largest Marlin shot by male and female in the world. So, you know, that gun can take down anything. And then you can also you can also peg it back that gun if you're shooting around the reef. You can run two bands and a 7.5 mil shaft, so you effectively get two guns out of the one. Yeah, nice. And then you know back down to your one meter or your 105 roller um, to cover you for all bases. You do a bit of travelling as well, Travis. What um what travel cases do you use for all your gear? Uh, I yeah. So I've got what are those hard cases that Sport, everyone sports knows? tube. Yeah, yeah, best thing going around. So, yeah. you know, you can pack them full of stuff and, mm. you know, I guess with how good baggage handling is these days, you definitely <laughs> Is that you were being sarcastic, I take it? <laughs> yeah, well, you've only got to look at guys like Nate Brejnak that, you know, went overseas travelling to Bali and opened up his bag and, you know, three or four spear guns were broken. So oh, yeah. you've definitely got to try and protect your assets, that's for sure. Mm. Yeah. And they are assets too, especially if yeah. you spend a bit of money and even time maintaining it, you know, like you really appreciate what you use and seeing someone handle it poorly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you, yeah. you can't beat travel insurance. Like I I get travel insurance through, through um, I can't remember what the company is, but, you know, it might cost you 80 bucks for the week and, you know, you're covered at least, you know, if something breaks in your bag, you know, I think they cover individual items up to 700 bucks. Like if they break a barrel or, you know, something gets crushed, I'm sure, you know, the manufacturer will be able to sort it out for around that price. So. All right. Um, sweet. So we've gone through your dive bag. Was there any other equipment you wanted to mention? Um, I'm just trying to think what else. I've... So I normally have that in the dive bag. Oh, flasher, obviously. Oh, yeah. Is um, that your own flasher that you make? Or? Yeah, yeah, we make our own. So we get we go and get um, a heap of, like, Perspex mirror, yeah. glue, it back, glue it back to back, and they're about 20 by about 10. Uh, probably bigger. Where are you buying the sheets of Perspex from? <laughs> well, I, I originally was going to get them. I, I was getting, I think I got the first one from like a plastic shop. Yeah. But they were very expensive. And then when Masters was shutting down, I actually went in there and got, <laughs> got 70% off. <laughs> so I stocked up. I got about five or six sheets. So I've actually, I've actually got about, I think, f about seven flashes in the shop made up, ready to go for anyone. But, um, you know, because obviously when you go out and do blue water, you know, the last thing you want to do is be under, under gunned or, you I know, think you've, I think, you, I think you've, only got, you've only got six flashes, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. You've got to send one down in the new spirit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so, so you make, you're making yourself, what, what float are you using on them? Um, just a chicken float. You know, you can get them anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, and use mono. A lot of, some guys use Dyneema, but be very careful of that because... You know, Dyneema is a lot harder to cut, um, and you know, if, if you're pulling that flasher up, shark comes in, grabs it, and takes off. That Dyneema is very, um, it's not as like it's it doesn't have the memory or that you know mono does, and there's every chance that something can go wrong. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, be very careful of using Dyneema on your flashes. You know, 500 pound mono that you can pick up from Tackle World or something for pennies. You know. Yeah. 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 Good point. All right, cool. Um, so yeah, so they're aim, yeah, they're aim right branded flashes. What do you what do you what's retail? Oh, not, on? They're not really aim right branded flashes. Oh, they're okay. just ones that I make for you know, like I've got good mates that you know I go diving with, and they're like, oh, make me a flasher. So <laughs> yeah, rather than you know buying something because they're not cheap these days. I was no. went into the shop the other day. It's like 170 bucks or something for you know a couple of bits of shiny metal, and it's like you know who's mate? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, the big mirrors. Definitely attract the big fish, same as everything, you know, big baits, big fish, all that sort of stuff. So you need those mirrors really ref reflecting the light and sending that light out as far as possible to draw those big pelagics in. Yeah. <clears throat> all right, all right. So, Travis, I think we've covered off gear, mate. That was excellent. All right, so the next section is um, Shrek's favourite section. <laughs> He's changed the format, and it's now called Spiro Q&A. Oh, so, what a great section. Who came up yeah. with that? <laughs> <laughs> Crowd goes wild. All right, so um, what do we do here? Do we read all of these? No, just pick, pick out the ones I'm you I'm going to pick out three of my favourites. Oh, four. 
Can I pick? Can I pick? I know they're all your favourites. So I know this is a wonderful format. Thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right. So here we go. Uh, if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? I've I've been very very fortunate, and I'll pro- I'd probably not change a thing. Wow. Good, good answer. I like it. Um, who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? Um, probably Jack Burnett originally, and and Rick Batua. That's how we find out uh, our new guests. That's a little secret one there. That's how we do it. And uh, could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? I love this one. Um, This has been a very hot topic recently, um, you know, on all the spearfishing pages on on Facebook. You know, a lot of guys out there, you know, are all about, you know, going out diving, shooting the fish, doing it all yourself, um, you know, not letting anyone help you you know, unassisted catches and all this sort of stuff. But I think that mentality this day and age is sort of, you know, it's 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 totally different these days. I reckon personally, and, and I work in this industry seven days a week, 365 days a year, and I, I talk to a lot of spearfishing people. And for me, I think the spearfishing experience these days is about jumping on the boat or going out diving with a, a couple of your really good mates, getting in the water, you know, working hard for fish, you know, if you land one that's a really good fish, that's a bonus. But I think it's about the experience and mateship and, and, you know, enjoying the moment of, you know, your mate landing a good fish. It's not all about you going out, getting the fish and, you know, having all the glory. It's about going out there, working as a team, you know, and, and all coming home safely at the end of the day. And if you've got a few good fish on board, you know, that's a bonus. Yeah, awesome. Great. It's a good summary of the sport, actually. That wasn't a sentence. It was two paragraphs, but I liked it. Yeah, I'm all about it. <laughs> all right, Trav, it's been uh, fantastic having you on the show. It's been a long time coming. Uh, was there any sort of parting um, bit of guidance for our audience? Where can where, um, where can people find you, by the way? Um, yeah, we're up in Cairns. Um, we live um, locally, about five minutes from town. Um, you know, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us on Facebook if you've got any questions re- regarding aim right or spearfishing in general. You know, I speak to a lot of young divers every week, um, you know, offering advice and, you know, helping them, you know, build new guns and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very open to people contacting me and, and asking anything they wish. Um, if I had to leave every everyone with something, I'd say, um, you know, dive smart. Yeah, all right, cool. So, aim rights on uh, Instagram, Facebook, and everywhere else. Have you got you guys got a website here? Yeah, our website is um, www.aimright.com.au, right, uh, cool. and you'll find all the information about you know products, team divers, you know stories, and and stuff like that on there, as well as a link to our shop. So, fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us today, Travis. No worries, guys. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for listening to today's episode. It was an absolute cracker. Big thank you to Travis Hogan. Uh, we've been trying to get him on the show for a while. And uh, thanks for speaking with us and letting us, uh, giving us some insight into uh, Aim Right Australia and, um, and spearfishing up there in North Queensland. Hope you got something out of it if you're out there listening. Uh, our next episode is with, we're going all the way to the US, New York. Uh, so we're going to talk to David Hodgman. Now, he is the gun, the guru, the man, the apex predator when it comes to hunting striped sea bass over there in the US on the East Coast. So uh, this is an absolutely fantastic episode. He holds nothing back. He runs Spirit Charters over there out of Rhode Island. And uh, from what I can gather, he just knows his stuff like nobody else um, we were speaking to another guest recently that uh, saw him out in the water and said, yeah, he, he was bagging out very, very quickly. So uh, he definitely knows his stuff. It's a very entertaining episode. Uh, he's a larger-than-life character, and I seriously recommend you get on board and have a listen uh, to that episode. Once again, thanks again for listening. Please, if you want to connect to us with us, uh, send me an email, turbo at noobspiro.com. Um, any sort of advice for the show, where you want to see it go, uh, anything like that. If you want to tell us about a great Spiro in your area that you think we should interview, 
I know the uh, guys in uh, Northern California uh, get on us a bit about uh, interviewing guys in their area. So if you have an area that uh, you want uh, to know more about, please let us know and we'll do our best to get somebody on the show from uh, your little region of the world uh, to help people out in your part of the world to become better Spiros. Once again, thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you in a fortnight's time with our David Hotchman interview. G'day guys, in today's episode we have talked about lots of different spearfishing equipment. Chances are you can get your hands on most of it at spearfishing.com.au. They've got competitive prices and an awesome hassle-free returns policy. They uh, have $15 flat rate shipping Australia-wide. Chances are if you order that equipment today it will be at your doorstep tomorrow. And you can even save a little bit more money by using the code NoobSpiro at checkout. That'll save you a further $20 on every purchase over $200. It also helps support the Noob Spiro podcast. So head over to spearfishing.com.au and save some money on some gear. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for listening to today's episode. It was an absolute cracker. I thought I was exceptional. Shrek, you, you're you okay. So <laughs> if you would like to connect with us further, get on to noobspiro.com and check out our email newsletter. It comes out once a month. It's full of the happenings and goings on around the place and some great deals on there from our sponsor, Adreno. Now, further than that, if you are a fan, need a new shirt or even just a grease rag, check out Noob Spiro's new line of shirts. Uh, so that's in our store there. And Shrek, what can they do if they want to become truly a master of spearfishing? Yeah, look, Noob Spiro podcast is always about helping people to become better Spiros and we have condensed and combined some of that information along with our own experience into an ebook that you can find on Amazon.com. It's called 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing, the actionable information you need to improve your spearfishing. Also, guys, quick request, uh, wherever you listen to the show, leave us a review. It helps other people find the show, and uh, it's always good to be chatting with you. Looking forward to getting in your ears again in another fortnight. Thanks for listening, guys, and hope you nail a big one.